Am I loud enough in the back? Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. All right, thanks. <clears throat> okay, so batch normalization is technically not an optimization algorithm. It's a way of designing your network that makes it easier to optimize. Um, the basic idea is that a traditional convolutional network would have uh, matrix multiplications where you've got a bunch of inputs in a matrix X, and you've got a bunch of parameters in a weight matrix W, and you multiply those together. And then usually you would pass those on to something like a rectified linear function. So batch norm says, rather than just doing this matrix multiplication, let's go ahead and apply a normalization step. And doing something that's a little bit unique for neural network architecture designs, it actually uses the entire batch to update each example individually. Most features that we see in neural network architectures update each example independently from all the others, so it can be parallelized across examples. So batch norm has two main steps. Uh, the first is to take the mean across the mini batch for every feature in the mini batch separately, and then to subtract that mean off of the activations that you have so far. That'll give you a new mini batch of activations that I'll call Z tilde. And in Z tilde, every feature has zero mean now. Then the next step is to compute the standard deviation of each of the features in the mini batch and then divide by the standard deviation. So now we have a mini batch where every feature has both zero mean and standard deviation one. Uh, we then go ahead and multiply by a parameter gamma and add a parameter beta. So it can have mean gamma and parameter beta. So it might seem a little bit silly that we go to all this effort to normalize the batch and then we give it any mean and any standard deviation again. The reason we do this parameterization is that it gives us kind of a checkpointing system where every time we reach one of these z hat points in the network, right before the rectified linear activation of every layer, we know that there's zero mean and unit standard deviation. And that'll happen regardless of the value of w, and it'll happen regardless of the value of the w's for the other layers that came earlier in the network. For other kinds of neural networks that don't have this periodic checkpointing where we get back to zero mean and unit standard deviation, every layer can affect the statistics of every layer that comes after it. For a batch norm, you only affect the higher order statistics, but the mean and the standard deviation stay the same at this checkpointed region all the time. And then at the very end of a batch normalized layer, we apply the rectified linear activation function, the same as we usually do. To give you an idea of what learning looks like with this kind of mechanism in place, we can step through two different scenarios. One where we look at um, a few different hidden layers updated with an SGD step, and then uh, also what it looks like uh, without batch normalization. Let's see. Oh, so I'm actually a little bit confused by my own thought. I might have included the wrong thing here. Uh, so sorry about that. I'm gonna actually show you something quick on the whiteboard because I've got the wrong plots there. So on the whiteboard, suppose that we have just several different numbers multiplied together. Oh, oh, there's, a, oh there's a light that's just for that. Uh, oh, the blue doesn't show up for yeah, me. Right. Okay, uh, yeah, sorry. It's a lot better. So we have several different numbers multiplied together. And this is uh, basically the simplest possible neural network that you can imagine. Uh, it's a neural network where every number is the weight matrix for a single layer. Every layer has only one unit in it, and there's no nonlinearity. So it's just a purely linear network multiplied through one step at a time. Um, you can imagine that the value of A will determine very much what the statistics of the activations will be like by the time we get to D. But if we added normalization steps after each multiplication, then the value of A doesn't actually determine the mean or the standard deviation over here. Mm. So why is that really powerful? The reason is that gradient descent is completely blind to these kinds of interactions between multiple different variables. If we take the gradient with respect to A, we might get a very big or a very small number depending on the values of the other parameters in the network. So the gradient with respect to A is B times C times D times E. And 
This depends on all four of these parameters. If any of them is close to zero, we end up with a little tiny gradient on A. And if any of them is large, we end up with, or if all of them are large, we end up with an extremely large gradient on A. So some learning algorithms use second order information to try to correct for that kind of effect. They can actually take second derivatives to see how A interacts with each of the other parameters. And then when you do things like invert the Hessian matrix to try to normalize the effect of all the different parameters on each other, you can get reasonable updates if you only have pairwise interactions between parameters. If we look at the second derivatives here, let's take, for example, the derivative of the first derivative with respect to B. We end up with C times D times E. So we actually, even in the second derivative, we have several different parameters interacting together. Using a second order method, like Newton's method, where you compute the Hessian, makes the learning algorithm far more expensive. It ends up being uh, quadratic in terms of the number of parameters just to compute the Hessian matrix rather than linear in the number of parameters you compute the gradient. And at the end of the day, you've only accounted for second order interactions. But in this network here, we actually have fifth order interactions. So if we went up to try to capture all the fifth order interactions, there wouldn't even be a straightforward way to uh, use a linear algebra solver to account for all those different interactions. And you'd have to compute a value that scales like the number of parameters to the fifth different derivatives in order to handle it. Because we use batch normalization, we're actually able to knock out some of the most important interactions between the first layer and every other layer. And in fact, between every layer and all the layers that come after it. Rather than looking at A, B, C, and D to determine the mean and standard deviation of E, we need to only look at um, the, the um, gamma and beta parameters that we introduced for that particular layer that comes late in the architecture. And so then SGD is able to adjust just gamma and beta to give the mean that it wants of that layer. And it's able to very safely make large steps on A, B, C, and D without uh, worrying that it's going to completely destroy the statistics at the higher level. Um, so if you look at the actual learning curves that result from using batch normalization, uh, the baseline inception is this dotted black line here. And using batch normalization, it's possible to reach higher levels of accuracy in much less time, in part because the learning rate is much larger. And that learning rate is actually stable now that there are these normalization layers in the network. Another thing that's really interesting is that uh, sigmoid layers, represented by uh, the pink line with the plus signs, can actually be trained quite well. And at the start, they do better than the original inception network without batch normalization did. It's true that the sigmoid values end up uh, saturating a little bit before the accuracy level that's attained by the baseline inception, but they're very competitive. That's really interesting because for years before batch normalization, we thought that it was just infeasible to train sigmoid networks. And a lot of effort went into things like designing pre-training algorithms that would train autoencoders or Boltzmann machines to give us weights that were good initializations for a sigmoid network. But all of those methods were somewhat heuristic. We didn't have clear principles that told us when they would work and when they wouldn't work. And they were very brittle and they in fact did not work in a lot of cases. It took very careful optimization of hyperparameters to get them to work at all. Batch normalization gives us a really easy way to train lots of architectures that were more or less infeasible before. And it's now ubiquitous. You see it in all kinds of different neural network architectures, uh, ranging from uh, you know, residual networks to the latest generative models that everyone is releasing. So this is probably one of the most important ideas in deep learning that's come out in the last five years. It's, it's one of the things that's made it possible to train architectures that were extremely difficult to train before. And it's made it so that uh, the search for hyperparameters is much easier because uh, the the range of hyperparameters that work really well without destabilizing the learning process has been greatly expanded. That's really it for batch normalization. Uh, does anybody have any questions about that? Yeah. Uh, do you use batch normalization with dropout? And is there any relationship between the two? Yeah, so batch normalization introduces some randomness into the training process because we compute these statistics on every mini-batch rather than on the entire batch of training examples. 
the reason we do that is we need to be able to back propagate through the normalization operation. And having this operation baked into the network makes it so that the layers are always normalized at every step in time. Uh, we don't need to do anything like have the layers gradually become un unnormalized and then get corrected. But as a side effect of including these operations in the network, we've made it so that the exact mean we subtract and the exact standard deviation we subtract changes every time we load a different mini batch X here. So that makes it so that this step is a little bit like uh, adding random noise, and this step is a little bit like multiplying by random noise. So dropout is traditionally done as multiplying by random noise. Originally it was multiplying by zeros and ones, but it also works really well if you multiply by a Gaussian value with mean one. Uh, so in that sense, this step of batch normalization really looks a lot like dropout. Anytime that you inject a lot of noise into a network, you force that model to become robust to that noise. And that helps it to generalize to examples that weren't seen at training time. Because every time you visit that same example while you're training, you don't see exactly the same version of it. You see different noisy versions of it. And when you apply noise to the hidden layers, the noise is even more powerful. So like, if you have an image and you add a lot of noise to each of the pixels, you're going to mess up those individual pixels. But you're not going to mess up like a large object part or something like that. If you have a photo of a cat and you add noise to every pixel, you're going to get a really grainy image of a cat. But when you apply noise to the hidden units, you can actually remove individual conceptual elements of the image. If your neural network learns to recognize a cat by looking for cat ears, and then you multiply the hidden unit that detects cat ears by zero, it won't be able to detect that cat anymore. And it'll be forced to learn another feature that will allow it to detect the cat. Now, if you're unlucky, it'll just learn a second hidden unit that detects cat ears. But if you're reasonably lucky, and you usually are because you have a lot of hidden units and a lot of presentations of each example, you will eventually learn another feature that detects like cat noses or cat whiskers or something. And now you have this really robust way of detecting a cat that should generalize to more images. So both dropout and batch norm have that effect because of this. The interesting thing is that dropout was designed purely as a regularization mechanism. It, it reduces the gap between your test error and the train error. Batch normalization was designed to make optimization easier, and as a side effect, it happens to do a little bit of regularization. So usually batch norm is not quite as strong of a regularizer as dropout is. If you have a really small data set, you probably need to also use dropout. And there are some papers early on that were saying that, for example, batch norm doesn't work with recurrent nets. Uh, one issue with the evaluation when people concluded that was that they were using really small data sets and they were measuring test error, not train error. So all that was going on really was that batch norm wasn't regularizing the model very much and it was overfitting because the optimization worked really well. So if you see that happening, you can actually combine dropout and batch norm together. Uh, one thing that's a little bit weird about it is that uh, the dropout masks will screw up your estimate of the mean and the standard deviation. In practice, that doesn't really seem to matter all that much, but you can actually do the math to correct for it if you want to. Yeah? I have a couple of questions. Um, one is uh, some libraries like Torch use a um, decaying moving average rather than just the batch average in batch norm. Um, yeah, so, yeah, when you, idea or, yeah, when you deploy the neural network at test time, if you want to process different sizes of batches than you deployed at train time, or if you want to make sure that every example is always classified with exactly the same function, uh, you can replace <coughs> this mean with a running average that was accumulated during training, and you can replace this standard deviation with a running standard deviation that was accumulated during training. At training time, you have to use the statistics collected on the mini batch, and you have to back propagate through that statistics collection process, or it, it won't actually work. But the, the gradient will keep proposing changes that try to undo the normalization, and you'll just you'll waste a lot of time learning things that just get undone immediately on the next step. Uh, but at test time, you're welcome to freeze this once the parameters aren't changing anymore. If you don't freeze it, it means that every time you load a mini batch, like say that say that the first example in a mini batch we kept fixed, and then we started loading different examples in the other slots of the mini batch, then our output for the first example would change from one mini batch to the next, which seems a little bit weird because it's the same example. 
And the good news is that all those different outputs should be more or less reasonable, just with slightly different variation in their estimate of the exact probabilities. But if you really want to make sure that you always get exactly the same output for exactly the same input, you should freeze these and replace them with single estimates of the mean and variance. Um, also, you mentioned recurrent nets. There's been some papers in the last few months specifically looking at some variation in the best norm for recurrent nets. Yeah, so like layer normalization is probably the best thing to use. Layer normalization? Yeah, for recurrent networks. Because, so with recurrent networks, you have this funny issue that you sort of see multiplication by the same weight matrix again and again and again. And it's not entirely clear what you want to do about that. Should you normalize each step independently of the others? Should you uh, try to get some idea of what the mean is going to look like over all steps and then like go back and retroactively apply it to all the different time steps? Uh, layer normalization just normalizes across units rather than across examples. It's also it's really similar to things that people used to do for convolutional networks, where people did uh, like what was called local response normalization. It's sort of like if you take local response normalization and make it extreme to include all the units instead of just some of them. Um, so for convolutional nets, it doesn't seem to be quite as good as batch norm, but for recurrent nets, it seems to be one of the most effective things you can do. When you're running average thing, why would that not work with training? I mean, if you if you know a batch size of one, like this doesn't work, right? If batch norm doesn't have anything to normalize over, right? if you wanted to emulate that, couldn't you just use a large enough running average would somewhat emulate even during training a co batch norm over a large batch size? So the running average is constant with respect to the parameters. If you look at what subtracting this mean does, uh, that's the easiest one to follow. The standard deviation one gets a little bit nasty. But when you subtract the mean, that guarantees you that the gradient will never propose making a change that just shifts the value of z. Um, so you, you will actually find that your gradient on z has zero mean when you have this normalization operation in here. If your gradient on z didn't have zero mean, you'd basically be saying, I want all the units to just shift upward a little bit, or I want all the units to just shift downward a little bit across the whole mini-batch. And that's sort of useless, right? Because uh, you, could, you could just add or subtract any constant value, and the code would have more or less the same semantics. Like, like the activations across all the different units would be raked in the same way, and they'd have the same amount of space in between them. Um, so if your learning algorithm just proposes doing things that uh, shift all the activations across the mini-batch up or down, you're just kind of wasting time moving the activations around and forcing the other layers to learn that now the activations have a different center. But it's not actually updating anything in a useful way. Uh, when you actually include all the <coughs> other members of the mini-batch as part of the function, that prevents you from just shifting things around as part of the learning process. Uh, and, and the running average, if you use that, it would be the same as if you subtracted off any other constant, really. Uh, that the, the learning process could still propose to move you away from it. You mean a large enough batch, you can estimate the sum of the entire so far, right? Over a very large average. Can the running average approximate that? I mean, it's changing. So it's, it's, not about, it's not about the forward pass. It's only in the backward pass that you start to see the problem. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is the Gutman data the same across all the layers? Oh, uh, usually there's, they're different for every layer. They're different? So yeah. Are these separate? Hmm? Or different layers? Uh, well, they're, they're parameters that are learned. So you would usually start with beta being set to zero. Oh, okay. And gamma being set to one. So but, no, they're going to learn that. Okay, yeah, see. yeah. Right. Uh, does Bashman have any impact on the quality of representations learned? Uh, well, you usually learn better representations because you're able to optimize better. Uh, it doesn't change the set of representations that are possible to learn. The gamma and beta make it so that you can learn representations that have any mean and any standard deviation. If we didn't have those in there, it would force you to learn uh, representations that have zero mean and unit standard deviation. And that might restrict you in some way that actually matters. But including these makes it so that you can learn anything that a traditional neural network would learn. So it learns better representation because we can run it longer? Is that also? Uh, well, not so much because we can run it longer. Usually we actually run it for less time because it trains so much faster. Yeah. You see how this one got up to an accuracy of about 70%, and this one got up to an accuracy of about 50%. 
75% or so. So this one is without batch norm and this one is with batch norm. Uh, it's difficult to say exactly how you measure how good a representation is, but I would argue that if you have an ImageNet classifier that can get 75% accuracy, it's probably better than an ImageNet classifier that only gets to 70% accuracy, uh, especially when both models have the same architecture. Uh, that, you know, it, it means that the representation used by the more accurate model must be better in some way. It's basically because like you, you, you free it up, the mean and standard deviation, so that it will pick the one that it's better for it, basically. Yeah. Because if you don't do that, then you're, it's forced to use whatever the empirical one is. Yeah. That's basically it. Uh, but then, I mean, using batch norm also gives, could give more weight to, let's say, lower layers. So that could also, I mean, it has more of an impact on the, I mean, on the classification, right? Because that's kind of what batch norm does, right? By bringing the mean towards zero, if you're using a redo, uh, uh, you're, you're using a rectifier, uh, then uh, it could have more of an impact on the output, isn't that? what batch norm enables, rather than just moving randomly uh, away from the mean. It's actually, it's really hard to say like how much each layer is used. It's kind of difficult to tell uh, which one matters the most, especially for rectified linear units. There's sort of this weird property that you can take any layer and divide it by two if you multiply the next layer by two and you get the same function back out. So there's not really a clear metric that you can use to look at a network and say which layer is it using the most. Because if you see that the parameters are really big at one layer and really small at an, another layer, or if you see that the activations are really big at one layer and really small at another layer, you can always just divide the big one by n and multiply the small one by n. And you'd end up with the small one being big and the big one being small. You get the same network back out. Um, so if somebody thinks of a better way, other than the size of the weights or the size of the activations, to tell which layers are being used the most, then you could try to answer that question. Uh, right now, I don't really know of a good way of answering it. I guess you, you could do things like maybe add noise where the standard deviation of the noise is like 10% to the standard deviation of the layer and just see like which layer is harmed the most by having proportional noise added to it. I don't know of anybody who's actually done that experiment yet, though. So it would be interesting to see if batch norm results in different parts of the layer being used, more or less. I bet it would really depend a lot on, if you don't have batch normalization, I bet it depends a lot on the size of the initial parameters that you choose for each layer. I wanted to ask, so the networks with batch norm and without are isomorphic in the sense that everything which can be expressed in one can be expressed in the other, right? Yeah. So when you train without batch norm and you finish somewhere, right? Which is not so good, like 0.7. Uh, why it does get stuck there? Oh, well, because the gradient descent algorithm has trouble seeing that different units are correlated with each other. Uh -huh. um, I guess I don't have Wi-Fi here, right? Uh, you do. You know what? I might, I might actually have the thing I want to show you on my desktop anyway. Yeah, yeah, Jeremy works here. He can definitely help you with that. No, I, I can actually probably find it. Oh, all right. Um, Maybe I don't actually have it. Um, yeah, sorry, that might actually have been, I was gonna show you something about optimization, but it might be from when I was. We can just log you in real quick. On my personal laptop. Hmm? We can just log you in real quick if it's yeah, sure. okay with you. Uh, do I need to like? Um, is it still SF visitor or USF visitor? No, or? I'm just going to USF wireless. Okay. Oh, you'll type in the secret code? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can, yeah, yeah, read it to me and I'll, I'll repeat it back. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, just copy the key logger out and go to the Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, so I'm going to show you, uh, I guess last time we were talking about optimization, right? But, um, mm. Oh, wait, it's still uh, connecting. Uh, oh, should be good now. Yeah. So I wasn't here last time, so I hope I'm not repeating too much stuff that everybody's already heard. But 
Uh, once this loads, I can show you some graphics that tell us a little bit about why gradient descent can fail. Um, so the second derivatives tell you a lot about how your cost function curves. Um, if you have a second derivative of zero, then your cost function is just like a flat line where you are. And that means that the derivatives tell you everything you need to know about it in order to go downhill. If you have non-zero second derivatives, if you have negative ones, it means that the surface kind of curves downhill away from you as you move in the direction where the gradient points downhill. And if you have positive ones, then it means that the surface curves upward as you move away from where you are right now. Um, then to get more complicated, there's actually lots of different directions in parameter space. So here's a 2D cross section. Uh, you can look at all the second derivatives that form what's called the Hessian matrix, telling you the derivative with respect to one parameter and then the second derivative with respect to every other parameter. Um, if you take the Hessian matrix and you take uh, a direction D and you compute uh, D dot product H dot product B, uh, that will actually tell you the second derivative in a specific direction D. Uh, so you can imagine that in some directions you have like a very large positive second derivative and in other directions you actually have a small negative second derivative. Uh, it turns out that these curvature factors end up really affecting how much you're able to learn from a gradient descent step. So uh, if you make a Taylor series approximation, you can figure out uh, what the value of the cost function will be at some nearby point. So uh, the Taylor series approximation is just where you use all the derivatives at the current point to predict what the value of the function will be somewhere nearby. You've probably seen it in one dimension before. So in one dimension, you have some function f of x, and you want to make an approximation around a point x0. So you start off by saying right here, the value is f of x0. And then if I go to some point x that's nearby, I can take the difference between x and x0 and multiply that by the derivative uh, at x0. And that tells me how much the slope says I'm going to go uphill. But then you also bring in this correction factor where you, uh, you use the um, second derivative to correct for the slope either not, not knowing about downward curvature or not knowing about upward curvature. So the um, multidimensional generalization of this involves using the Hessian matrix, but it's still basically the same idea. You take the cost at the current point, and you take the dot product between the step to the new point and the gradient, and then you also have this other term involving the Hessian matrix. So you can actually use that approximation to figure out how much the, the uh, gradient descent step will decrease the cost function value by. So over here, we have this term theta minus theta naught, but this is just uh, the direction of the step we're going to take. If you plug in the learning rate times the gradient to that formula, you get this formula for the value that you think the cost function will have after the gradient step. So it turns out they have two different terms. One of them is you subtract epsilon times the gradient dot product is with the gradient itself. So that's just the squared L2 norm of the gradient. So that says if you have a really big gradient, a gradient descent step is going to decrease your cost a lot. But then there's this second term that you add back in, where it's 1 half times the learning rate squared times uh, the gradient dot product Hessian dot product gradient. So this gradient Hessian gradient term here, well, that's giving us the second derivative in the direction of the gradient descent step multiplied by the norm of the gradient. So that tells us is that uh, if we are unlucky and the gradient points in a direction where the function curves uphill really fast, then that upward curve can actually outweigh the downward linear slope. Uh, gradient descent is completely blind to this upward curve. So if you don't reparameterize your model to make these second derivatives be close to zero a lot of the time, you'll end up with those second derivatives becoming really important as you learn. So the way that you can tell how quickly you're going to learn is you look at the ratio between the norm of the gradient and this g transpose hg term. 
When this is really small, it means that uh, the linear slope is really small compared to the curvature that will make you go shooting back uphill. And usually, as you train the network, you start out with the bottom not being very big and the top being really big. Uh, but as you train longer and longer, the bottom becomes gigantic. And so you actually still have a gradient, but you inadvertently go uphill because of the curvature all the time. Does that make sense? Yeah. And no momentum on other fancy gravity set algorithms. So momentum can help you a lot if your Hessian matrix has eigenvalues that are all close to each other, meaning that the curvature is about the same in every direction. And then Nesterov momentum can help you more if the curvature is very different in different directions. But it gets harder and harder for any second order method to save you the more that you have differences between the curvature in different directions. Any other batch norm questions? Yeah. What other uh, options for normalization are there? Any promising ones? Well, uh, so there's weight normalization. Uh, that is where you normalize the weights instead of normalizing the activations. And you choose the parameters so that the activations are initialized. And if you're lucky, they'll stay initialized. And it's, just, it's kind of simpler to analyze than batch norm because every example is processed independently. Uh, you can also do batch normalization where you subtract only the mean. And that, that's a little bit easier to analyze too because there's not the dependence on the, the um, standard deviation. And then if you want to get really obscure for generative adversarial nets, I use this thing that I call virtual batch normalization, where uh, I want to make sure that I get the same function every time I load a different example. I don't want the function to depend on what the other examples of the mini batch are. But I still want to get the benefits of batch norm. So I introduce a second, a second batch of examples that is kept the same forever. And I compute the mean and the standard deviation on those. And then during training, I load other mini batches. And I normalize them with the statistics of that reference batch. Uh, if, if I only use the reference batch, then sometimes the parameters just sort of learn to avoid causing big activations on the reference batch. So to take it one step further, in virtual batch normalization, you also use the current training example, but not the other ones in the mini batch to update that mean and that standard deviation. And that seems to work a little bit better. Uh, that was pretty important for getting generative adversarial networks to make recognizable dog faces and stuff on ImageNet. Uh, without that trick, I wasn't able to get it to happen reliably. Uh, but I, I don't know of any case other than generative adversarial nets where virtual batch normalization is important. 